Hello, everybody. Welcome to Wisdom from North. My guest on the show today is one of the world's leading spiritual teachers and one of my favorite spiritual teachers, mm -hmm. Teal Swan. She was just here yesterday and did a fabulous workshop. Um, many people came and it was amazing. And today I think we're going to speak about relationship and some of the questions that you have emailed me as well. Till, it's wonderful to get to know you and meet you in person. And thank you for being on my show again. Thanks for having me. This is awesome. It's like I get to see you on Skype and now here you are in person. Yeah, it's been really nice. And we just went to the park and hung out. And uh, I was pondering about what I was going to ask you because our last interview was on Skype and we talked about the law of attraction and we really went into depth uh, about that subject. And it's been very popular. It's been watched by like 114,000 people. And I can really recommend uh, watching that Skype interview. But today I want to speak about the concept of soul groups and soulmates and twin souls and relationships because that's something we all have to deal with in life and I'm really curious if you can talk about you know the concept before on the other side like before we go into this world what kind of agreements are we making and are we in kind of a soul group uh, before we go down here so is that the souls we are meeting on earth on the planet Okay, so before you come into this life, you are part of a perspective which takes into account all perspectives. So it's almost like if you took every perspective of every living and non-living thing in existence, you combined it all, that is what we are calling source or God energy. But just like you can divide a pie up and each piece of the pie is still the pie, that's kind of how the universe works. So. Another good way to conceptualize of this with the mind is to think about currents within an ocean. So let's say that you could be a part of the East Indian current, and I could be a part of some current that's going past Hawaii or something like that, but we would both still be the ocean. So it may be helpful to think about soul groups or the soul family that you belong to as a, a specific current within the ocean. Does that make sense? Yes, but what is then an individual soul? An individual soul would be like a current within the current within the ocean. So in previous years, I have really made a good like a analogy, I think, about a wave. So if you, can, if you look at a, a big wave, you could think about an individual soul like a wave that's within a bigger wave that is then part of the ocean itself. That is what an individual perspective is. It's almost like source consciousness is just dividing and dividing and dividing and dividing down to the singular, the most singular perspective that it can maintain. It's trying to hone in on it because of the preferences that are birthed from that singular perspective. And the preferences, of course, give rise to the expansion of the universe. Now, so your question basically was, how does that fit into the grand scheme of things with source consciousness? Now, the reality is, what I want to do as source, let's just pretend we are God or we are source. What I want to do is to understand me. But to understand me, I have to step outside myself. I have to see myself in relation to something. So that's the, the reason for the division in the first place. And the more that that divides and divides, the more perspectives it has to look at itself with. So let's look at this in terms of a soul family. If we pretend that you and I are, are all part of one soul family, and that soul family wants to gain the most amount of perspective that it can, it's going to want to come in and in as many ways and in as many relationships as it can. So, so let's just take you and me. If you and I are part of a soul family, we want to know everything we can possibly know. That's our goal then what I want to do is to experience you as a lover, experience you as a mother, experience you as a daughter or a son, everything I can think of so that I know what that perspective is like. I want to exhaust my perspectives. But how many souls are in a soul family or a soul group? There's no way to say that because it's not just living beings that are part of a soul group. It could also be inanimate objects as well. So this table could be part of our soul group. <laughs> Wow. 
Okay. People, I mean, people don't think about this because we, lo we love to make a, a differentiation between what's alive and what's not alive. But everything is imbued with consciousness. So everything is ultimately God. So God is also the table. So we could say, what soul family portion of God does the table belong to? Because the table is kind of an, uh, a part of a soul in a way. It's just an aspect. Yes. Hmm. Exactly. Okay, uh, so why, um, why are we divided into different soul groups in a way? And how long are we kind of stuck with that group in a way? You can migrate if you'd like to. You can change if you'd like to. They call it a soul migration. Sometimes you will choose to do that because of the you want the different perspective. So, um, okay, are you can understand the, it this way. If we look at the world and we get really racial, okay, you could look at the collective consciousness of mankind, or you could hone in on the consciousness of African Americans in general on Earth, or you could hone in on the consciousness of Asians, and. And I can tell you, even though we could have a lot of words go between us about what those perspectives mean, more than that, you can kind of feel into the difference in, uh, in them, like energetically. So you can feel that the perspective or the feeling of African American has a very definite feel, whereas the feeling of Asian has a very different feel. So if I'm coming into that experience, I am basically putting on that perspective. I'm looking through those lenses. Make sense? Mm -hmm. So... Sometimes it benefits souls, if they have exhausted that perspective, to come into a totally new perspective. So a soul family is just like that, but on a bigger level. It's like uh, one soul family will have the consciousness of African Americans plus Asians plus whatever else, plus extraterrestrial consciousness going into its perspective. But that perspective still has a certain feel. And, they, and that perspective still has desire. Isn't it interesting to think about that? The individual is not the only one that broadcasts forth desire. Whole soul groups do. Mm -hmm. So for example, there's a soul group within this universe that, that is called by the humans Abraham. Mm -hmm. That particular soul group is desiring and desiring right now for people to line up with their expansion. Okay. That's what they're desiring. Their whole goal is about that, right? Uh, our soul group, mine particularly, which is Adonai, is the most interested with humanity coming into a state of pure oneness. Okay, can I just ask you, um, I just have to put my sweater on here. Um, Adonai, is that a planet? What is that? And how do you know that that's your soul group? It's the word that was chosen by humanity for the soul group that I'm a part of. We, This soul group that I'm a part of was educating humanity a long time ago, in fact. It began before the birth of Christ, in fact. So the, in fact, there's the, it's really funny to admit, but if you look at the soul families that teach specific groups of people, Adonai is the one that was teaching the early Judaism and the early Jewish mysticism the most. Mm -hmm. So we've, we're making a comeback, I think. <laughs> Okay, so how does this work? Like, let's say we're on the other side and we're um, deciding that we're going to go down on this planet and I'm going to, you know, become your lover or we're going to be soulmates. But then again, I'm confused about how this works out with co-creation. Let's say I'm here right now and I'm supposed to meet this man, but I, I make some different choices. So I don't meet uh, the one that I had an agreement. That's Okay if you don't meet them. But your internal guidance system before you even come in is going to be programmed for that thing that you knew would serve you. So it's like a child comes in with preferences. Have you noticed that? Anybody who's had kids will notice that even from the get-go, this kid wants to do horses. This kid wants to do ice hockey, right? And so what we have to acknowledge is a lot of that desire is in fact coming in response to the original decision we made before coming in. It's like we it's like we roll the the ball and then whatever happens along the course is influenced by a lot of the things we interact with but that rolling of the ball is what sets it all in motion so we set our lives in motion and then we continue to choose along the path but your internal guidance system your emotions are always going to be leading you in the direction of those things which most benefit you and often throughout the course of your life you are going to especially on a soul level 
to some degree stay in alignment with your original choice, because that was the whole reason you're here in the first place. So let's say that the whole reason you wanted to come down here was to experience what real love is like. So you got the ball rolling by saying, okay, I want to know what love is. So I'm going to come down to a family that doesn't want me. Bam, so you roll the ball, right? Now everything in your internal guidance system is going to lead you in the direction of true love. That was your original intention. So let's say that you had set up a soul contract with some man to meet in your 20s or whatever. And is it that specific? Like oh, Very specific. So, well, it depends on the soul contract, too, but it can be that specific, yes. So let's say you were meant to, you, you set a, this soul contract to meet when you were 20 years old. Your internal guidance system is always going to be veering in that direction. It's going to keep leading you in that direction. So to the degree that you find alignment with that, that internal guidance system, which is, of course, positive or negative emotion, what feels the best, to the degree that you line up with that is the faster that you will line up with that or the easier you will line up with that, the less resistance there is to lining up with those soul contracts. And soul contracts aren't always yummy. You know, a lot of times it's like you made the contract with somebody, if you wanted to know true love, who really didn't want you. That's a contract too. I make a contract with a mother, so you and me, let's say. We know that w I know you and, and you know me, and we're ultimately one at a higher level. So what I might say, since it's all like a vibrational conversation, but what I might say to you is, okay, it's going to benefit both of us for you to understand what love is, and so you have to understand what love isn't. So I'm going to go down, and I'm going to have this experience, and that's going to cause me to get so out of alignment with myself that I get pregnant at 16, and I don't want you. I'm going to play that role for you so that when you come down into that experience, you feel unwanted, and that makes you desire being wanted so much that that becomes your aim, your goal, and you're going to get it. But you wouldn't have even known you wanted it without me. <laughs> but let's say, you know, you meet uh, someone. A lot of people made a contract with Hitler. Really? Mm -hmm. Stalin has even more, in fact. Sorry, I go out of body sometimes to look at these contracts because I find it highly interesting what souls are uh, trying to do on this earth. So when you look at like uh, these mass murderers like Stalin and like Pol Pot, a lot of times when you see them, their singular thought form within the six dimensional reality, you'll see these links to like millions of different beings that all chose to create that contract together for the sake of the expansion, not only of themselves, but of an entire group of people. Huh. So you go out of your body at night and then you go out and then you go up to uh, the sixth dimension, which is a higher dimension. I can go to any of the dimensions until you bleed into basically the perspective that's all one, that's source consciousness. But the sixth dimensional consciousness is still one that the, the physical mind can like uh, translate. Mm -hmm. So I find that the sixth and seventh dimensional realities are the most easy f to comprehend. It's like the level I want to see that that experience at. Plus, it doesn't involve like multiple timelines the way that other time-space realities do. When you get to the higher dimensional realities, if I'm looking at a, a soul contract with someone like Pol Pot, I'm also looking at all of his previous contracts with everything, so it can get very jumbled. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I have to ask some more questions about that, <laughs> because this is highly interesting. Um, so do you feel basically that, I mean, when you're able to do that, can you get an answer to anything? I mean, even your own stuff, your own issues, you can just get the answers. I mean, yes, but, but. yeah, because I'm wondering if there's uh, still challenges then when you can get all the answers. Now, what's my excuse is the question. <laughs> You can, but the thing is, is that relative to yourself, there's always going to be a little bit of an issue with really seeing yourself objectively, because it's like you're looking through, I'm in my perspective, so I'm looking through the lens of teal, right? So in order to see myself objectively, I have to literally remove myself from the lens of teal and then like look at it objectively, which is why it's more easy for other people to see us. And that was how it was intended anyways, because you seeing me is really me seeing me. If you catch my drip. But that's why it's really difficult to see yourself clearly. So let's say that you get 
you're looking through your lens, right? This is my perspective. Let's say something really painful happens and it causes me to drop into a frequency that's so low about this that now I'm not even a vibrational match to experiencing these interdimensional realities mm -hmm. where I can get there. So what's really what I find interesting is if I drop into a really low frequency about my own life, then there will be a point that I cross where it's like I can no longer hear my own spirit guides talking, which is very rare, but it does happen. So I have to essentially raise my frequency first in order to access those kinds of dimensional realities. So the answer is yes, I could tell you anything you want to know about me unless I'm in the lowest of the low kind of vibrations, and then I'm just like everybody else. It just rarely happens relative to myself. That's interesting. So let's go back to you know the relationships. We come down here and we uh, meet someone we are attracted to, and we get into this relationship. And um, huh? I said, "Oh dear God!" Yeah. Attraction is a very complicated subject. Yeah, because I'm wondering about that. What is it? I mean, is that the recognition of that soulmate in your uh, soul group? Only sometimes. Oh. So attraction is, is a biochemical reaction within the body, but it occurs in response to multiple different things. So you could have that reaction in response to your soulmate. You could also have that reaction in response to finding somebody who is the mirror of your subconscious aspect, which is not always pleasant. So this is the thing which complain, which really confuses the majority of people because they're like, well, my emotions told me yes about this person and then in two months he was, you know, screwing my best friend and burnt my house to the ground and, you know, all of that kind of stuff. I know that's an extreme example, but it's true for some women. So they're going like, okay, well, I followed my guidance system. That was definitely not my soulmate. I could tell, you know, when he threw my clothes off of the balcony. So... <laughs> what was going on. And what we have to understand is we got to think of ourselves like a magnet, right? So even though our emotional guidance system definitely is always pulling us in the direction of growth, growth is not always going to be a positive feeling thing, right? Mm -hmm. Those of us who've been through painful things when we're looking back at it years in advance can say, oh my gosh, that was so good for me. But let me tell you, in the middle of it, you're going to be like, that is the worst thing that has ever happened to me. So it's going to be pulling us in that direction. We've got to understand that. But when we feel attraction, it means that there's a polarization. Mm -hmm. Polarization means we're not in a state of wholeness. <laughs> so I know I'm making this face. Well, the opposite attracts, right, in a way? Well, you'd think so. <laughs> It actually doesn't work that way. See, doesn't, isn't that sort of confusing? He, on this hand, we're talking about the law of attraction, which is like attracts like. Mm -hmm. So then it can't be true that the opposites attract, can it? Right. I can explain this to you in about 10 seconds. Ready? Okay. <laughs> the majority of the time, this is what's happening with attraction. Let's say that I am raised in a family that's not okay with anger. So this family says, you are not going to show your anger. Little girls have to keep sweet. So for me to belong in that family and to keep getting approval, I have to suppress my anger. So after a while, when you reject or dis disown or deny an aspect of yourself, it becomes an aspect of your subconscious self, your subconscious mind. Mm -hmm. It becomes a suppressed self. So I will be walking around consciously thinking, no, I'm not angry. Everything's fine. When in reality, I have a suppressed aspect that's very angry. So everyone that knows me thinks I'm really sweet and I'm really lovely and I just love everybody, right? That's going to be your experience of me. But I'm going to keep attracting men who are really angry and it will seem like they're my opposite, right? But all they are is a mirror for my subconscious aspect. That's like attracts like. So the only reason really that we find our opposites is because there's an aspect of us that we have suppressed, denied, and disowned that wants to be re-owned. So we're externalizing the re-owning. We're basically putting ourselves through a process of trying to fall in love with what we rejected within ourselves. That's why people attract each other. It's the number one reason, in fact. But when it comes to attracting soulmates, if you were going to make a contract with somebody, wouldn't it make sense to do that? To say, my goal is oneness. 
That's my uh, everybody's goal. So the integration to become completely whole and self-actualized is my goal. That's really the ultimate soul goal that all of us have. So wouldn't it benefit me to get out of alignment, to reject the angry aspect of myself, and then to have a contract with somebody later where I am forced to look at that mirror and to love that mirror and to reown that anger. <laughs> so, so basically, um, we have the idea of the soulmate completely wrong. And in this this aspect is something that people have a hard time accepting because we have been raised and suckled on a very odd idea of relationships. So if you watch mainstream media, mainstream media is going to sell you on the idea that the perfect relationship is what you want to go for because it's going to make you feel better about everything. So it's basically, mainstream media is selling you the idea of a relationship more like a drug, more like take this pill, which is the person, take this pill and you're going to feel good all the time and someone's going to approve of you all the time and you're going to, you know. So it's basically helping you to escape from your emotions. Now the reality is, though you can feel very good in a relationship and it can definitely add to your life, it's much more beneficial for a soulmate to trigger you into a state of wholeness that may or may not be comfortable. And so I feel like what's happening is we're being set up within society to think of relationships in a very unrealistic way. We're basically putting the whole weight of our lives on another being and saying, you know, unless this person makes me feel good 24 hours a day, this is not the soulmate. But the soulmate, from a universal perspective, could be your worst enemy. So, I, I mean, it was quite shocking to me when I was in my teens and was going out of body a lot to try to figure out this dynamic of uh, relationships and how it worked, to find out that one of my soulmate contracts, because there's not just one, one of my soulmate contracts was, in fact, with my abuser. I can understand that. Because that takes a high level of consciousness to understand that. <laughs> yeah, but I can understand that that's, you know, that's almost um, unbearable to uh, realize mm -hmm. in a way. And I mean, there's many people who have gone through dif difficult relationships. And when we talk about that, you know, this is um, a pre-contract in a way that this is uh, decided on from before, it kind of feels uh, unfair, <laughs> you know, because you, in a way, you want to feel like a victim. You're angry and you don't want to ever be with that person again, you know? So I think it takes a lot of uh, work on yourself to get to that state where you can forgive. Yeah, exactly. This is a real big mistake that people make in relationships when they get to this phase where sometimes in the, in the soulmate relationship, which should be differentiated between desiring a relationship that can help you maintain like that sense of uh, basically unconditional love. You can desire that. So, so we should stop here because we, it sounds to some people, and I can tell because now I'm, see, I'm actually looking right now at how people are going to perceive this. There's a bit of a letdown in the experience. So if you are the kind of person who really has a clear desire to experience a romantic relationship with somebody that can last permanently throughout the course of your life and add to your life instead of take away from it, then you cannot have that desire without it being meant to be yours. So it's not like I'm saying all your relationships are going to be painful because that's the point of a relationship because that's not the case. But we need to differentiate between the soulmate relationship and that kind of relationship which could or could not be the soulmate relationship. <laughs> Okay, so how can you attract that? How can you attract that soulmate relationship and d differentiate between, you know, that, um, that kind of... Uh, you, can't. You, you can't? You cannot differentiate because the thing is, huh. to get to that relationship, all you got to do is to clear out the aspects that are in the way of that relationship. <laughs> so the thing is, is that like every soulmate, even if it's comfortable or uncomfortable that you meet, on the trail to that thing you ultimately want, which is the good feeling relationship, is essential to even get you there. Well, that makes sense. So here's an example. This is a common example. It's the archetype of a woman who continually ends up in relationships with someone who is not going to be a partner, can't commit. 
Okay, so let's just be honest. The, like, if I look at female consciousness on the globe, the number one issue is this man will not commit. So if you've got a woman who is in that type of a pattern, then what will happen is she will, she will find soulmate after soulmate that basically abandons her. I can't commit. I'm not going to commit. But yet she keeps jumping into these relationships, keeps doing the same patterns. That's what the pattern is about. So what will happen is she will do that until she lines up with, and they'll get bigger and bigger. We should know that about mirrors. Each successive relationship gets like a bigger and bigger mirror for that until we're ready to break the pattern. At which point it becomes painful enough usually that we turn towards ourselves completely. And this goes for women and men, but in this case, we're doing a woman. So the woman turns towards herself and says, you know what? I'm going to get really conscious. I can't do this again. So I have to look at the, the childhood wounds in me that are making me compelled to, to go in the direction of this. And then I'm going to have to make a lot of different decisions in my life. And one of those decisions might be to break off the relationship with the pattern. So you, now what we, we make a mistake as people thinking that what we're doing is breaking the relationship with the person. So we make it about the person when it's really about the pattern. So like, let's say that you've got that guy in your life who's not committing. And, and you may be in a place where it's very much so in alignment for you to say, you know what, I'm breaking it off, I'm done. But what you're saying I'm done to is not necessarily them because all relationships are eternal. You're part of them no matter what. So what you're saying I'm done with is that pattern. You're basically saying I'm done playing the game where I'm all in and they are not. I just have to say something here because it was really good to hear that you're saying that it's internal. The relationship is internal because I think sometimes when you, you feel like uh, or you want to break up, you feel like you don't want to lose that person because then it just the person disappears. It, it's not there anymore and you can't handle that. No. But it's still, I mean, you will still meet. Yes, yeah. you will. You're, you're still going to be a part of the same thing. So all you're saying, if it comes to that, is I'm done with the pattern. I'm not going to make that choice anymore. Where if you don't come forward, I'm not going to keep chasing you because it's killing me. But why is it so hard to let go? Like, I think everybody f knows something about that, let, like letting go. You know you have to let go. All your friends are saying, let go, let go, let go. And I, I mean, I can just talk about myself, just letting go of my past. I'm like, where to let go? There's still something there for you. I mean, this is very difficult because you'd expect that as a spiritual teacher, I'd say, if it's bad for you, just get away from it. Yeah. I wouldn't, in fact, say that. I would say, don't make it about getting away from the person. Don't make it about breaking the relationship unless that feels like it's in alignment, unless it feels like I'm really ready to end this. Then don't end it. But what you got to do instead is focus entirely on aligning. So it's almost like letting the universe do it. This is like the best advice you can ever get for, a bre for breaking up, basically. Instead of making it about the decision to end it or to keep it going, you just, you just stop focusing on that. And instead you focus on your alignment. So what I would do is pour myself into figuring out all the patterns that are going on with me. Pour myself into finding alignment. And if it feels in alignment to talk to them, talk to them. You don't need to do the no talk policy unless that feels good. And what you'll notice if you just spend your whole time, and it does take effort, if you spend your days trying to find your alignment, trying to find your alignment, and just lining up, lining up, then what you'll notice is naturally your vibrations shift. And either, and then that's the universe will choose, either that person fucking commits or else you will actually see them go away. But this go away will not feel painful. It's not going to feel like, oh my God, I just lost everything. When that happens, it usually means that it's premature. So the, the relationship is premature or he is it off. If you get into a situation in a relationship where it feels terrible to break it off, it's premature. It just, yeah, because we're used to hearing that, oh, you got to be strong. You just have to move on. And it doesn't feel right to move on. Then don't do it. Now, this is going to be the most challenging thing for all of your girlfriends because, because it's going to put them in a position where they have to consider that there is something valuable in the experience for you to continue struggling with the dynamic until you are shifting your vibration. Now, you will feel stuck, but it's not actually true. 
a lot of that stuckness, in fact, that feeling of stuckness is just a reflection of a wound of feeling stuck when you were a child trying to get attention from a parent that wouldn't give it to you. That's the most common pattern that we find. Now, why is this so prevalent with, with young girls? Because a lot of us had dads that didn't know how to emotionally connect with us. So we're still in that position where we're in our little tap shoes, you know, trying to do the dance, and daddy's like looking at the paper or off at work. So we're just stuck in that feeling and that dynamic and unhealed about it. So when we start to heal that dynamic within ourselves, we'll actually start to lose interest in it. That's much better than just making a physical action. Saying I'm done with the relationship and taking a physical action should only be done when that feels like relief. So it's really about, you know, yourself all the time, healing aspects of yourself. It's not about that other person, those other people, those circumstances. It's about you, always. Yeah, it's always about you. It's always, always about you, and it's easier said than done, but I mean, face the music. Most of us, when we're dealing, especially in this particular dynamic, with an unavailable man, with a man that will not commit, how well has it been going to try to control his behavior? It doesn't work. So what we have to do, basically, is to say, you know what, I got to take my power back. The only way to do that is to basically take the power in terms of figuring myself out, ask the most important questions start doing things that nourish me, start increasing my frequency on my own and get as much help as I need to do that. And then the answer will come. That's the answer. The answer is really not, it's like when you know, you know. Until then, you don't know. <laughs> but we, are very, we have a hard time being uncomfortable, so that's the reality. We, as women and as men, we have a really big issue feeling the feelings of grief, feeling those uncomfortable feelings of stuckness. And so we want to take a physical action to end the feeling. And often when it comes to relationships, we take that step and then it gets worse. You know, mm -hmm. we take the action, we break the relationship off and then we're on the floor for five weeks crying and eating boxes of chocolates, walking <laughs> soap operas. So, <laughs> so what we have to learn really is the ability to, instead of take physical action when we're really out of alignment, we need to come back to ourselves and be willing to feel these uncomfortable feelings because that's the subconscious that's rising up and saying, look, you're about to become something new. You're about to step into a brand new vibrational set point. And if you're willing to really be with yourself and then keep going in the direction of just more and more alignment, then the answers take care of themselves. You don't need to do the work of that. That's what's so good about it. When you're, this is not a graceful process. Like none of relationships in general are going to be a graceful process because we never had the perfect example. So we're, we're breaking new ground at this point in history in terms of relationships. So it's not like this is just going to go smoothly. You're going to have those moments where you ignore your internal guidance system and you say, fine, we're done then. You know, and then 10 seconds later you're on the ground and then you're going to find what alignment is again. <laughs> so that's pretty much how it's going to go. But the point is you're going to learn your own alignment. So in a way you have to trust that that relationship that wasn't good or that wasn't your soulmate is taking you to that other uh, soulmate relationship. If you can trust that, then that would be very, very good, yes. I think it's a beneficial idea to consider. The majority of people on this planet are not going to be able to just trust that because it sounds like complete hooey and when you're in a hell of a lot of pain, especially relative to relationship, Anybody promising you that it's taking you to something better is like, no, no. In fact, it's happened to me eight times before, so why wouldn't it happen again? But I think it's a good idea to consider that people, especially me, are basically telling you that that's how the universe works because it can provide some kind of hope. But I think that if you can't feel that way, it's okay to not feel that way. It's okay to be hopeless. Isn't that an interesting idea? We don't have to rush to feeling good or rush to believing that there's a perfect person out there. Sometimes we can really just say, you know what, right now I'm feeling pretty hopeless. You know, I just love hearing that because you are here in Norway and now you've kind of uh, gotten into, you know, uh, how things work here, the energy here. And we're all about, you know, moving forward and uh, going online to find someone or, uh, you know, you got to do this and you got to do that. You can't just be in that state of hopelessness or uh, being the emo in the emotions, you got to, you know, fix it. And that's uh, hard. It's hard to be vulnerable here. Yes, it's exhausting. Yeah. 
I yeah, I'm, I don't know how popular I'm being this week with the Norwegian people because of how honest I'm being about the issues that are happening on an emotional level in this particular country. But I, this this I this sort of like you can't ever show your weakness. You've got to just push through everything. Type of mentality is um, it's really exhausting. I would think it would be very difficult to date here. Uh, but it's just good good to have the allowance to be able to stay in your emotions and go through the process and and that it's okay to have a messy relationship. You know, it's okay. We don't need this Facebook profile all the time. <laughs> okay, I don't know one person on earth, literally, who has a relationship that's clean. Everybody has a relationship that's messy in some way. And also, all of us are transforming something in our lives. Even like, you know, high transcendent spiritual teachers have come in specifically for expansion. That means that they have been given or given themselves something to work with, something to exalt. Mm -hmm. So there's not a person on earth, if they are living, there is not a person on earth who is not working to create an improvement out of some situation. And relationships are just the same. Every couple has their thing that they're trying to transform or exalt. It's almost like two couples come together and many things, aspects of the relationship are just amazing and these other aspects are kind of like a lumpy form of clay. And what we do as a couple, the real good couples, will come together, get their hands dirty, and mold out of that clay is something like a beautiful vase together. That's really what a successful relationship is about. But the couples that do the very worst are the ones that expect it to always feel good. If we walk into a relationship saying, you know what, there's no way that as a person, I can't even think about myself positively 24 hours a day. How am I going to think about another person positively 24 hours a day? It's not going to happen. So it becomes a practice. So if you and I are entering into a relationship, this is what a conscious relationship is about, you and I would say, I know that it's not always going to be feeling good. So my commitment to you is that I'm going to get my hands dirty when it doesn't feel good. And that creates the security. So even if we're not feeling good, we're not feeling good, but we're together still. And that creates a higher vibration than the lower one that we would be experiencing if we expected it to always feel good. Is this the new spiritual relationships yes. that are emerging? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I like that. And so, and it's beautiful to watch because the couples that you watch that are in that type of mentality, because they don't expect the other person to keep everything feeling good 24 hours a day, they approach the negative experiences almost with an attitude of excitement. Because it's like, oh, now we have something to work with. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. I love that. Yeah, it is. And so what you watch when there's an issue in the relationship is it doesn't cause the couple to go away. Both people basically challenge themselves to come forward in those moments. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's like, it's amazing. So I'm thinking that the human race, once all of it adopts this new paradigm of relationships, it's really going to be something quite beautiful. Wow. I received a few emails from people and there was this girl, um, her first name was starting with a T, so you know who you are. Uh, and she was asking about relationships and she had a breakup uh, with a man uh, she really loved because uh, he was unfaithful. And she still finds that she uh, loves him and has this hope. And she's wondering about if, I guess, if it's okay, it's okay to have this hope or what she should do about it. I mean, is it okay to go back or should she go back or should she, you know? This is difficult because it should always be an individual choice. Like to have, it's really easy for women to fall into the trap of listening to every female friend that says, if a guy cheats or if something happens, you should instantly be done. That needs to be an individual choice because it is true that some couples actually grow much stronger and much more happy after something like that. But when trust is broken in the relationship, it must be repaired. It must be repaired or else the relationship really is doomed. So it's an individual decision that a woman should ask herself, is this the kind of thing that I would like to come back from? Can I come back from it? Or is it literally just too much of a message of I'm not committed to you or I don't want you or I'm not willing to work on it with you that it's not self-loving for me to stay? So it really should be a question according to self-love. Is it more self-loving for me to try to see if relationships can come back from this right now? Or is it more self-loving for me to draw the line and set a boundary? And that's enough for me. I feel like we, we listen to society too much. Society says, if a guy cheats on you, let go. But that's not the source perspective. Source perspective is, 
it's a cultural belief if a man cheats on you or if you cheat on him that the relationship should instantly be over because that's a human contract that we make with each other. But I mean, we could just as easily have been born into a society that believed that um, having sex with another person was the same as hugging another person. Mm. What if you hugged another man and that was enough grounds for somebody to break up with you? Yeah, because that's the issue. I mean, a lot of people are unfaithful. And when you're in a relationship, uh, you easily fall for others. Like, do you have any advice? Okay, first of all, you are, <laughs> okay, even if you are madly in love with your partner, meaning like I, I totally love my partner, I'm attracted to my partner, even if that is the case, you're going to develop attractions to other people. We got to know that going into it. Because otherwise, it's like the second somebody looks at someone else, they're in trouble. When it turns into an issue is if you've made an agreement with each other. And some people don't make that agreement. But like, if you make an agreement with each other that this relationship means I'm going to give myself to you sexually and not somebody else, then that is an agreement we made. That's a level of trust now that we've established. And so I can violate your boundaries by doing anything other than that. But... When you watch people cheating, after they've made that contract with each other on a conscious level, then it means that there is something that is missing. So by the point, this is something that's hard for us, gotta fucking call it, gotta call it, okay? By the point that somebody cheats on you, if you've already made that agreement, you have missed almost every cue that you could possibly miss. I mean, when I see a couple, right, where somebody cheats, Looking at that person objectively, you're looking at one month, two months, three months, six months, potentially years of that person being unhappy and no one talking about it. It is the lack of communication that is making it so everybody cheats. But isn't it uh, only that you can fall for somebody else because maybe that's another uh, part of your soul group? Or Yeah, potentially, but I, it's very unlikely because of our need for the secure attachment. Humans need a secure attachment, and we are even on a genetic level. Let's just leave the soul out of it. On a genetic level, we are essentially programmed to bond for a minimum of 13 to 14 years with one partner. We are? Yes. <laughs> so, well, we've got a mix of genetics, but basically that is how we would have raised our young to a degree that they could have taken care of themselves. So... <laughs> It's not even in your genetic favor. After you develop that secure relationship, that's a huge like stronghold for your life in general. That's for people in general. So what I notice, I, I mean, honestly, I, just, I have to talk to you from the standpoint of what I know. What I know as an extrasensory is that I have never in my life met somebody who fell in love with another person during a relationship where the relationship itself was happy. Because, because this is what works. You get into a relationship, you're really happy at first. Why else would you be together? Let's just assume you fell in love. Okay, so if you fall in love with somebody, let's say I fall in love with you. That is creating like you know this beautiful sort of happiness for me for a time. That's why I'm on cloud nine, right? Then we start getting in our first little arguments. Now that's contrast. And I might be desiring, like everybody does, what I would prefer as opposed to the arguments that we're getting into. Now, if that builds and builds and builds and builds and builds, I will then attract somebody into my life that fits those things. Mm. So if I'm frustrated with a wife that's super, super fat, <laughs> I'm just being really honest, if I'm super, super irritated with that, I'll probably attract a really skinny woman who's really interested in me because I'm still creating. So it means that there's something I'm unsatisfied with. I'm not talking to you about it. But subconsciously, I'm giving rise to all this expansion. So it's going to manifest. Mm -hmm. So our issue is that we are unwilling to get our hands dirty in negative emotion. I'm unwilling as a man to come to you and be like, I, have an, I don't like this aspect of our relationship. Can we work on it together? These are the reasons why. You know. mm -hmm. Do you see us doing that? Most of us don't do that. So, so um, maybe a tricky question, but... Um... What if you discover that you're bisexual, that I'm in a happy relationship with a man, yep. and I discover that I like women, and um, I want to test that out? Uh, does that mean that my relationship is unhappy still, or is it just that I want to explore this part of uh, existence in a way? This, yeah. It could be that you want to explore that existence in that particular scenario, or it could be that you're miserably unhappy. 
it could be either one, but let's just pretend that the scenario is that you just have to explore that aspect of your new personality. If you have ended up with a partner currently who is not okay with that, then that means the relationship is unhappy. Mm. So, so like we have to understand that relationships are constantly evolving. They're never going to stay the same. You're, you're never going to stay the same. So how can a relationship stay the same? I mean, what woman out there is the same when she's 18 and marries a guy than when she's 40 and still married to the same guy? You're a different person. So what we're looking to do, if our goal, of course, is to stay with one partner, what we're looking to do is to first partner up with somebody who is okay with the evolution, meaning that they're committed at least to evolving. Then we have to work on allowing the relationship to shift and mutate and change into what it wants to be. When we become very rigid is when we lose our relationships. So in that scenario, I say, you know, I really want to explore this. This feels like my expansion. And the partner says, no way in hell is that going to happen. Bam, puts the door down. Now my expansion is pulling me in a different direction than their expansion. So what we want to do always, because you have one option when you give rise to a desire, and that is literally to achieve it, is we have to have the conversation about how we can, how and if, if being a key word also, we can allow for that expansion while staying together and both be happy. So it's not about sacrificing. So it's like if you say, I'm going to change my job, I just decided I want to move to Japan. I then have to, with you as a partner, discuss about how we can make that happen, but also that being in alignment with what I'm desiring. But if literally I've decided that my happiness cannot possibly include Japan and yours must include Japan, we have got to break up. Like there is no other option. You're going to end up miserable. That's what we don't, it's a story we don't want to know about desire. And it's also why desire can be so beautiful and also so horrific. But you have to honor your desire, yeah, right? You must. You must. And the really good partners are the ones who are interested in each other's expansion. <laughs> but that, um, I think, uh, implies that you have to have worked on yourself beforehand to be able to let that other person have that experience. So let's, just, let's just go out on a limb and just say it. If you are a match to an interview like this, if you're choosing partners that are not interested in their own spiritual evolution, you're dead in the water with relationships completely. Because the reality is it's Pandora's box. You can't become conscious and have that be your new desire for life and be with a partner who is unconscious and be happy. It's not possible. So your partner either becomes conscious also or you find a new partner. <laughs> It's like, yeah, it's sad sometimes. A lot of people break up for this reason because one person's ready to wake up. The other person is like, I don't want to. That's scary. I don't want to look at myself. I don't want to look at the shadows. And then you're in trouble because you can't close Pandora's box, can you? Well, this is interesting. <laughs>